You know, when you move from the big city to the country, it's supposed to be more relaxing. For the birds? I hate them so much. Hmm, yeah. It's hard to dig yourself out of a hole, even if you're clever. For four seasons, Marty Bird and his family have had to navigate through irrational cartels and irrational local criminals along the Lake of the Ozarks. Each time one side's dealt with, they would inevitably trigger a new worse problem from the other. Part two of season four is here. Let's open up some of those secrets and how the show got there. And I'm gonna kill you. Really? I'm gonna kill you if you don't no, tell you me. No, you are not. Everyone knows at least one person who burns through get rich schemes, each one crazier than the last. Okay. When we were all stuck at home trying to pass the time, we learned that there's money in big cats, and that money attracts some uh, colorful people. People like the Langmores. Ruth's father and uncle had decided to get in on the exotic animal trade, but without a sweet tiger hookup, they went with the biggest cat that lived in their area, Bobcats. In the third episode of the second season, Ruth's frustration gets the better of her, as it often does, and she frees the Bobcats that the elder Langmore had trapped. If she can't break free, at least the little murder kittens can be free. Fast forward two seasons, and Ruth has lost the last person on Earth she legitimately cares for, her cousin Wyatt, who she had been trying to get into college and out of the Langmore cycle. She manages to find a new level of angry and heads off to kill Javi, the man responsible. Doing it will entrench her even further, trapping her deep in that cycle. While she builds up the nerve to do in Havy Cross in the street, she sees a pair of bobcats, or thinks that she does. A symbolic reminder that she has a choice. Naturally, she still makes the wrong one, but the symbolic bobcats tried. In 1994, there was a hip-hop concept album that told the story of a man growing up in the Queensbridge, trapped by his environment, making what he can of it, and yearning for a way out. While it seems like an odd fit at first, Ruth can really relate to the overall themes from the album Illmatic by Nas. It's no wonder that Ruth is a fan of 90s East Coast hip hop. She's a big enough fan, in fact, that she'd make a pit stop on a revenge trip to tell Killer Mike she loves his uh, stuff. I appreciate you, thank you. Ruth's love of East Coast hip hop from the 90s was seated in the third episode when she asks Tuck if he's into artists like Eazy E and Tupac. From there, the showrunners built Ruth's fandom with Notorious B.I.G. figuring into Ruth's playlist over the course of the series. For Ruth's revenge ride, music supervisor Gabe Hilfer suggested Nas's Illmatic as the soundtrack for the episode. Killer Mike's appearance came as a result of an unexpected friendship between Laura Linney, who plays Wendy, and the rapper. Turns out Killer Mike was a big fan of Linney's from the show The Big C, and on a flight that they shared, he talked about her, and about what a big fan he and his wife were. Since then, they've been keeping in touch. Killer Mike had already been public about his love for the show, and Linny was able to contact Killer Mike, who was all too happy to appear. Killer Mike isn't the only musical fan of the show to have their fandom rewarded. Broadway soprano Rebecca Luker, a three-time Tony Award winner, became a fan of the show under less than stellar circumstances. She was diagnosed with ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. While she was offstage, she told the New York Times that she'd been watching Ozark in lieu of other musicals. Sadly, Luker succumbed to her condition in December of 2020. As a tribute to their Broadway fan, when Ruth and Rachel see a lawyer about the status of Darlene's shares in the casino, the lawyer they visit is named Rebecca Luker. Laura Linney posted a memorial on her Instagram account for the singer when she passed. With season four set to be the conclusion of the saga of the birds in the Ozarks, the showrunners were faced with the obligation of bringing all the stories around to a satisfying conclusion. 10 episode seasons has become the new default for streaming shows in the new landscape, but showrunner Chris Mundy felt the show needed a little extra time to bring the series home. After negotiating with Netflix, they settled on 14 episodes split into two, so they still felt distinct but allowed the show to finish without bleeding over into another season. Even with the extra episodes, the ones for the second half of season four ran longer than normal, with the finale topping 70 minutes. Part of the allure of so-called prestige television is that it brings with it theatrical production values. 
That means shooting on location. Not, of course, on location in the Ozarks. Like many productions, most of Ozark was shot in and around the Atlanta area. Around a lot of the Atlanta area, it appears. Kemp Film TV Video was able to get a hold of a production schedule that showed that the fourth season would cover 40 unique locations. To make things even more complicated, those 40 locations were covered in 30 shooting days. That's a lot of crew moves. There was a time when television shows didn't really have endings. There was no need to plan anything out except to continually get renewed. Shows like Babylon 5, where an overall arc for the series was intended from the beginning. Now, serialization is all the rage as shows like Breaking Bad and Lost to set the stage. Bringing the shows in for a satisfying landing has been a tricky proposition for a lot of shows. There are several high-profile belly flop endings. As the birds spiraled further and further, there had to be an endgame for them, and showrunner Chris Mundy had settled on what that would look like more or less by season two. Though there were still some surprises and revelations along the way, but he told The Hollywood Reporter that he knew the emotional landing he wanted and tried to set that up as the stages progressed. Marty's whole plan relies on everyone acting in a cool and calm, rational manner and not do anything rash. So naturally, everyone around him does eight rash things before breakfast. The king of unpredictable behavior in Ozark is Wendy's brother, Ben. Ben's arrival in season three not only derailed everyone's plans, it went back to the rails and braided them before throwing them in a tree. The seeds had been sown for Hurricane Ben all the way back in season one, when an offhand line about Wendy's delinquent brother was mentioned. Mundy decided to introduce him in the flesh as a complication for season three, ultimately being the final spark that almost catches the birds up. Jason Bateman, along with his sister Justine, has been around for a while, with his first role in Little House on the Prairie. But for modern audiences, Jason Bateman's biggest claim to fame is his role as part of the Bluth family on Arrested Development. In fact, part of the allure of doing this show was to shake the perception of Bateman as a comedic straight man. Not that he's running away from his success. There were subtle nods to his time as a Bluth, where he played a relatively smart guy no one listened to, so he wasn't straying that far. One of the longest setup for payoffs for a gag was the senior Bluth repeating, All his money in the banana stand. Which turned out to be literal. He stashed cash in the walls of the banana stand, something Michael only learned after it had burned down. Stashing money in the walls becomes a practice for the birds as well. The kids even talk about finding some left over as the family made their final doomed attempt to leave the Ozark adventure behind them, saying that they left it there for the next tenant to find. Television shows and movies exist in a reality that is a lot like ours, except for some small tweaks. It's not just the 555 phone numbers. All the brand names and recognizable properties that make up the background noise of our existence all have to be cleared or licensed for use in a movie or a TV show, which is a hassle. So sometimes shows opt for a reasonable facsimile when a show is depicting young people or single older guys. A video game, oh yeah, that's sure to show up eventually. In this case, Ozark has taken a page out of 13 reasons why, specifically in the game that does not exist, Desert Duty. The game, a not-so-subtle replacement for Call of Duty, first appeared in 13 Reasons Why before being a game played in Ozark. If we were prone to generating elaborate theories out of some barely noticed minutia, there might be evidence that the entire run of Ozark is actually all of the characters trapped in a nightmarish afterlife. And why? Well, Hannah Nordum tweeted out something she noticed in the background of the show, specifically the televisions. It's not just that they're all playing a Canadian Football League game or even the same Canadian Football League game, but they're playing the same highlight between the Toronto Argonauts and the Alouettes from where else? Montreal. That would explain why so much seems to happen in a seemingly short amount of time. Because in Ozark, there is no real time. Just that one moment between Canadian football teams played over and over again. Or it's just a handy bit of footage to throw on a TV playing in the background. It's one or the other. 
The old adage for writers is to write what you know. And there are a surprising number of authors who have had dragons and or spaceships in their lives, apparently. Show creator Bill Dubuque had spent his teenage years working in the Lake of the Ozarks at a resort and marina and felt that it would be a great backdrop for the show. In a relationship that fits right in with the show, during his time as a deckhand, he was known primarily as Tall Paul's brother. As mentioned before, the role of Marty Bird runs into contrast to the role of straight man that was Michael Bluth or his character in Hancock, but there was more than just breaking out of an acting mold. Originally, Bateman was going to be the sole director for the first season of the show. Without enough time to prepare for the full season, Bateman ended up only directing two of the first season episodes, and then more as the series progressed, including the finale. The last two episodes of part one of season four were directed by Netflix veterans veteran Robin Wright. A lot of actors have their quirks. Brad Pitt and Robert Downey Jr. like to snack while they act in their scenes. Just like Run DMC prefers their Adidas, Jason Bateman has a particular fondness for New Balance sneakers, specifically New Balance M1400 DMs in the military gray. Not a particularly easy shoe to find. Bateman's characters all share his love for the same pair of military gray trainers. Did you notice that? Never underestimate the power of branding. Sometimes when a show or movie is popular enough, they start to leak out into the real world. In Los Angeles, you can have food delivered from Los Polos Hermanos, Gus Fring's money laundering company from Breaking Bad. There's even a bar modeled off the cantina in Star Wars called Scum and Villainy. Even though it's a show about corruption and organized crime running rampant on the shores of the Lake of the Ozarks, the tourist spot has embraced the attention from the show, including opening up a Marty Bird's restaurant. Probably best to keep the books tight on that one. These days, people are becoming more aware of how movies and TV shows use color palettes as part of the show. The Defender show on Netflix highlighted colors associated with the heroes. And of course, as we all know, in order to indicate a shot taking place in Mexico, everything gets a nice coat of yellow. Ozark has its own hue that it uses in all of its shots, blue. The intent there is to create the feeling of everything happening under the cover of darkness, of being underhanded. At the center of Ozark is Marty Bird's expert level money laundering skills that he uses to spare his life when someone at his firm skims a little profit, and it dominates the way that he thinks and approaches every problem he has, sometimes to the frustration of those around him. To make sure the money laundering seemed authentic, the cast and crew got a crash course in how to make money go from ill-gotten gains to totally legal-gotten gains. As a result, the money laundering principles in the show are pretty accurate. But, 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 but they hasten to point out that you cannot learn money laundering just by watching the show. And so, you took all those notes for nothing. Sorry. After four seasons, it's hard to imagine anything being too much for Ruth. She entered the show tough as nails and has only gotten tougher as she's gone on. Sure, she's had plenty of crying moments, but she's had sad things stacked on top of other sad things stuffed in more sadness. That's why it's hard to imagine Ruth as squeamish about anything, which might be true of Ruth, but it's not true of the actor playing Ruth, Julia Garner. When Ruth was using a mouse to detect the effectiveness of her booby-trapped dock that was meant to kill Marty, a hand double had to be employed because Julia Garner could not keep it together holding the mouse. When the animal handler tried to ease her concerns by comparing the tail to other things, that just uh, turned her off of those things as well. There's plenty of symbolism to go around with Ozark, and that's not just in the opening graphic, though those are pretty clever. Netflix insisted on a title card, but Bateman didn't want something lengthy and intrusive, so the O with the four graphics hinting at parts of the episode was created for that. To complete the requirement that the name of the show appear, the graphics spell out the Zark. The name of the central family has a few meanings. First of all, birds are known to migrate like the birds from Chicago to the Ozarks. Showrunner Mundy also likes to think of the birds as an invasive species disrupting the delicate ecosystem of the Ozark underworld. Yeah, it makes sense to me. The money laundering might be fairly accurate, but there's some details that might not be as accurately depicted. 
Shows like The Simpsons, and especially Futurama, are notorious for having math experts on their writing staff and featuring immensely complicated math problems to make the handful of people that advanced in math chuckle. In the seventh episode of the first season of Ozark, not only is the math not complicated, it's, uh, it's wrong. Marty had made a simple addition error in one of the money calculations. It was in his favor, though, so... Was anyone else hoping that the final resolution of Ruth's story would end up being the Bobcats coming back? I mean, weirder things have happened. Why not murder Kit and Ex Machina? 